I'm Dan. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I want to do what I want to do today is basically take you through an example of a proof in homotopy type theory. And I will say that this is the first time that I've tried to explain this kind of proof, like the actual details of the proof, to people who don't have a background in type theory. So I spent a bunch of time kind of polishing the proof and getting it as simple and pretty as possible. And I think I can at least give you sort of a flavor for how it goes. But please, like, work with me. And when there are things that are unclear, like, raise your hand and flag me down and tell me what to explain and stuff like that. OK. So I want to say a little bit about why we do computer checked proofs. So what does that mean? What it means is that I've typed in a proof and gotten what's called a proof assistant, which is a programming language for doing proofs, to believe my proof. And the nice thing about this is that, so for example, we do a lot of this in computer science now. And when you're reviewing a journal article or something like that, if the journal article comes with a computer checked proof, then to believe that the theorem in the paper is true, all you need to do is read the definitions and read the theorem statement. And then you run it through the proof checker, and the proof checker presumably says yes, or else they wouldn't have submitted it to the journal. And then you know that the proof is true. So if you don't want to, you don't have to actually read proofs. You can kind of delegate that to the computer. So that's one motivation. Of course, if you want to understand what's going on in the proof, then you still have to read it. But the other motivation is that you get to do what are called computer-assisted proofs. And we'll see a little bit of that today. You can kind of do your proof working with the computer and get some help from the computer on doing these proofs. And the other thing that I want to talk about today is sort of type theory, this notion of type theory as a logic for homotopy theory. So we're going to see some of the cool things that are going on in the special year this year about combinatorial definitions of paths and spaces. And Vladimir's univalence axiom will come up in a key way. And the other thing that's kind of cool about this way of doing homotopy theory is that it's intrinsically computational. So we'll be doing a proof, but at the same time, we'll be writing a program. And we can actually run that program and kind of compute some stuff, a little bit at least. OK. How many people were here for Steve's talk last week, just out of curiosity? OK. Good. OK. That's a good sense. So for people who weren't here, the picture that I need to sketch for you just to get started is this idea of homotopy type theory. <laughs> So what we're doing in the special year this year is exploiting a correspondence between type theory, which was invented by Martin Luff in the 70s, and uh, homotopy theory and higher dimensional category theory. So there's this correspondence where these three things that were developed independently all turned out in the end to be the same thing, which is really cool. And we're kind of getting this interplay where Type theoretic ideas are helping us do homotopy theory. Homotopy theoretic ideas are helping us do type theory better. And it's all very fun. So the main idea with the analogy is, in type theory, there are things called types. And under this analogy, a type corresponds to a topological space up to homotopy or an infinity groupoid. So I've drawn this type A here as like this squiggly space. And then in type theory, there are things called terms, or which correspond to points of the space or objects of the groupoid. And there are things in type theory called, well, we used to think of them as equality proofs. And under this homotopy theoretic interpretation, equality proofs correspond to paths in the topological space, again, up to homotopy, or morphisms in the higher dimensional groupoid. So for example, if I have points m and n here, then I can have a path alpha between them that's going to correspond to an equality proof in the type theory. And the type theory has the structure that you would expect for paths. For example, if there's a path alpha from m to n going that way, then there's a path alpha inverse. I'm going to draw it like that, but it's really just going back along alpha going that way. And if I put in another point p here, and a path beta like that, then in the type theory, we'll have an operation of composition, which will say, if I have beta, which goes from n to p, and alpha, which goes from m to n, then I can get a path beta compose alpha, which is going to go all the way from n to m to p. Okay? So the structure that you expect here is really getting modeled in this logic, in this syntax of type theory. And that'll be easier to explain once we get into some type theory and actually start doing some proofs. So what I'm going to prove for you today is a very simple example 
of proving that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers. Okay. So what is that, in case there's any type theorists in the crowd who haven't seen this theorem before? So there's the circle. Okay. If I have a space, then I can pick a base point, let's call it base, and look at all of the paths from that base point to itself. Okay. So I can go once around the circle, or I could go around the circle twice, or I could go around the circle backwards, etc. And this notion of paths from a point back to itself forms a group. The group operation is, of course, composition, because if I have a path here and then another path, I can compose them and get another path, et cetera. Okay? So anyone want me to review fundamental groups? Good. Great. Moving on. So how do we prove that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers? Well, we construct something called the universal cover of the circle. The universal cover of the circle we will often draw as a helix. And the idea is the universal cover is a space sitting above the circle. So if I have a circle down here, I have the cover up here. If I pick a base point on the circle base here, then I can look at what's called the fiber. So this will come up in the type theory which is all of the points that are sitting on top of this particular base point. And I'm going to label these 0, 1, minus 1, because there's going to turn out to be integer many of them. And the key property of this cover, this is what's called a vibration, and the key property of a vibration is that when I have a path in the base space down here, I can lift it to a path in the cover up here. And in particular, when I go around the circle down here, that's going to correspond to going up one level on the helix up here. So if I start at 0 and go around the circle, I end up going from 0 to 1. Okay? So I bring up the universal cover because the way that I formalize this proof in type theory is by mapping. So if I have a path on the circle, sorry, if I have, so the key thing is that paths on the circle are going to correspond to points in the cover. So when I have a point in the cover that is a number, n, I can send that to the path. If I call the path that goes all the way around the circle loop, then I can send it to the path loop to the end. Okay. And coming back, so I'm trying to show that this fundamental group of the circle is the integers. That is, there's a group isomorphism between the paths on the circle and the integers. When I'm coming back, uh, what I want to do is sort of say, loop to the n goes back to n. But in the type theory, what's going to happen is that we don't a priori know that every path on the circle is of the form loop to the n. That's essentially something that we're going to be proving today. So the way that you, in the type theory, uh, explain why you can get a map back is using this lifting property. So what you say is that any path down here lifts to a path up here. And it's via this lifting where we send alpha, any path on the circle, to the lift of alpha into the cover that's going to get us our map back there. Okay. So I'll get to that again in a little while. But I just wanted to broach that idea of universal cover, the helix, and the path lifting of paths in the base up into the cover. Yeah? Um, yes. So like what we're going to do is we're going to give these two maps, and then we're going to prove that they're the identity. That's essentially like the entire talk today. OK. Questions so far? Yes. Yes. So points in the fiber. So if I pick a base point, then the fiber of the base point is Z. I'll do this all again when I get to the actual definitions in the proof. OK. Um, good. So all right, we're almost there. We're almost ready to like start actually doing some proofs. But before we do that, I need to explain to you how we represent the circle in type theory. 
And the idea is that the circle S1 is going to be represented by an inductive space generated by, well, a circle. So in particular, we're going to have a base point and a loop around it. So what we're trying to capture here is circles up to homotopy. And the key thing about a circle up to homotopy is just that there's a base point, and then there's a generator for one non-trivial path from the base point to itself. So we also have, for example, the identity path that stays still there. And if we have a loop, then we can compose it together, et cetera. But the way we talk about the circle is we put in a base point and a loop. The way that we say that in type theory is by saying that the circle is a type. So S1 is a type. Read that as space. And the base point is a point or term of type S1. Okay, So the base point is kind of sitting in S1. And then using an idea called higher inductive types, we're going to put in a loop, which is a path from in S1 from the base point to itself. So this is our way in type theory of representing this picture of a circle is a point with a loop around it. Okay? And from this definition, you get an induction principle. Oh. You get an induction principle for circles. So um, actually, let me come back to this in a little bit. I'll do that in a second. So what I want to do now is switch to some code and start walking you through the proof of this fact. OK, so let's kill that. All right, so the first operation we need here is called loop to the, OK? And the idea is loop to the n computes loop, compose, loop, compose, loop, dot, 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 n times if n is positive, or loop inverse, compose loop inverse, compose loop inverse n times if n is negative. So I'm writing loop inverse as exclamation mark n. So this alpha coming back here is written in the proof file like that, exclamation mark alpha. Okay. Or it gives you the identity path for 0. In the type theory, we have defined integers. And we've defined this notion of paths that works for any type. So for any type, there's a notion of paths on that type. Okay. This is saying it's a path. I omitted the circle because you can kind of tell what space you're in from talking, the fact that you're talking about the base point here, because the base point isn't point on the circle. Okay. And then I'm going to write a function that for every integer gives me a path from base to base. So what are integers? Let me just jump to that for a second. So an integer I've defined inductively by saying an integer is either positive, negative, or 0. And positive takes a positive number, which is one or successor of a positive number. So I'm really boiling numbers down to a like, bare bones inductive definition. A positive number is one or successor of a positive. An integer is either positive with some n, 0, or negative with some n. So that lets me define functions out of integers by uh, recursion. So basically, if I wanted to define the successor function on integers, how would I do that? Well, I'd say successor of 0 is positive 1. Successor of positive n is positive s of n. Successor of negative 1 is 0. Successor of negative successor of n is negative n. OK? Any questions about the notation here? Good? OK. Let's do something fun. So how do we define the function loop to the? Well, loop to the 0 is the identity, because there's no loops at all. Loop to the positive 1 is a loop. Loop to the positive successor of n is loop compose loop to the n. So I just 
inductively string on one more loop. Loop to the negative one is go counterclockwise. Loop to the successor of n is loop inverse compose loop to the negative n. Okay? Any question about my inductive definition of loop to the here? Okay. Let's do a little proof. So what I've stated here is a theorem that, let me just explain the notation to you. For every n, which is an integer, there's a path from loop to the predecessor of n to loop inverse compose loop to the n. So what I'm proving here is a little bit of the fact that loop to the uh, preserves is a group homomorphism. So what I wanna, when I want to prove that loop to the is a group homomorphism, I need to show that it commutes with addition, right? It takes loop to the n plus m is the same as loop to the n compose loop to the m. What I'm doing here is just the, the little bit of that for n minus 1, okay? And for this one example, I wanted to actually do the proof with you here so you can get a feel for what a computer-assisted proof looks like. So the way that you start is you've stated this theorem. You've said, here's the name of the theorem. Here's what it's proving. Questions about what it's proving? Okay. Let's do the proof. So to do the proof, we say loop to the preserves pred of n. And then we get this little hole in the file here. And we can ask the proof assistant, which is Agda for this, is the name of this proof assistant, what am I supposed to do in this case? And it says, you're supposed to give a path from loop to the pred n to loop inverse compose loop to the n. Okay, how should we get started? Yeah, okay. So, Anybody want to know how predecessor is defined? So predecessor is defined just like successor was. It's a simple induction, okay? So when you have this kind of induction, then the way you're going to prove something here for all n int is, of course, by induction on the integer n. So we can ask the proof assistant, hey, let's break up into cases for n. And what it did here is said, okay, you've got three cases. Either n is positive, n is 0, or n is negative. Okay? So this is computer assisted proof. We're using the computer to help us do the proof. And then in each of these cases, we can say, okay, what am I supposed to do now? So if I look at the 0 case, for example, it says what you need to do is give a path from loop inverse to loop inverse. Okay? That's a nice easy goal, right? Because we need a path from something to itself. Okay. Why is that what we need to do? Well, if you look at the definition of pred, then loop to the pred n is going to be loop to the minus 1, which is, of course, loop inverse. And here we get bang loop compose loop to the n, where n in this case is 0. Okay. So that's the identity. So what we're doing here is getting the computer to do a little bit of simplification for us when we ask for what am I supposed to do in this case? It did that calculation using the definition of pred and of composition and of loop to the in order to get us a slightly simpler goal. Okay? And then what we can do is just fill in the identity and say, okay, great, that's the identity. Okay, more cases. Which one do you want to do next? Pause. Okay. So for pause, we can say, OK, what am I supposed to do? And it says, what you need to do is loop to the pred pause n, bang, loop inverse, loop to the pause n. OK? So it didn't actually simplify very much in this case. Why not? Well, the computation of pred on pause n depends on whether n is 1 or n is more than 1. Because for 1, we're going to get 0. And for more than one, we're going to get something else. Okay? So what we need to do next is we need to look at n. So I'll just say, OK, I'd like to peek at n next. OK, give me two cases. Either n is 1 or one is, n is, well, successor of what's now called n. OK? And then we can go through these cases. So when n is 1, 
we need a path from the identity to loop inverse compose loop. Okay, why is that? Well, loop to the uh, predecessor of one is of course loop to the zero, which is the identity, and loop inverse compose loop to the what was it zero or one is loop. Okay, all right. So why is there a path between the identity and loop inverse compose loop? Right. So when we're talking about this picture, we have all of the facts that you would expect. For example, if you go from m to n and then you go back along alpha inverse, then there's an operation here that collapses that composition of something with its inverse. Okay. So yes. So there's an axiom there that's in the type theory. So we can type in the name of that axiom, which I think I called bang inverse left loop. And then we can ask the proof assistant uh, to tell us what's going on. So if you write a term here, so bang inverse left says bang inverse on the left of loop, then it says, oh, great. You're supposed to give this. You gave this. Okay. And it happens that I wrote bang inverse left this axiom so that it says loop inverse compose loop is the identity. Okay? What I needed in this case was the identity is loop inverse compose loop. Okay? So I want to do a little move to flip this around so I can apply the inverse of that. And then, okay, I have what I was looking for. And so I can say, okay, great. Okay, so now we just covered that case. We finished it. We're good. Awesome. Um, this loop inverse No, so we were giving a path from loop compose inverse loop to the identity. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's not in the way that I've defined things. Yeah, I, we can talk about it after. It could be, perhaps. So, really, type theory talks about what are called weak infinity groupoids. And in general, in weak infinity groupoids, you don't have that that holds as an equality. You hold, have that that holds up to a further path. Okay? Was there another question somewhere? Okay. So I want to do one more of these. So let's do pause successor of n. Okay. Everybody following along with like what we're doing here? Is it like making kind of intuitive sense? Okay, so what do we have to do here? Well, this is going to be a slightly more complicated proof. We've got loop to the pause n, and we need to show that that's loop inverse loop, loop to the pause n. Okay? So what we want to do, how do you want to do this proof? We basically want to squish loop inverse and loop again, but with the pause n sort of sitting there. So what we can do is we can say, in the context of, so let me just write this out, loop to the pause n, I can do inv l loop. OK. So sorry, that scrolled off. but. Let's read what I just wrote here. What I just wrote is, with this context, loop to the pause n, sitting off to the side, please give me a path between id compose loop to the pause n and bang loop compose loop compose loop to the pause n. Okay? And that's just by sort of saying there's a congruence principle that says if, so the map here is this congruence principle that says if this equals this, then this compose loop to the pause n equals this compose loop to the pause n. Okay? This is the last thing that I'm going to live code for the rest of the proof, so don't worry that I'm going to like do the whole proof with you. Okay. So I just wanted you to kind of see a little bit of how this all gets put together. Okay? So that's just a guess that what we want is to do that. And then one thing you can do when you're doing these proofs is say, okay, I came up with a fact. I think that fact goes in the middle of two other facts. And then you can say, okay, so what do I have to do on this side? 
So on this side, it's yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So you could rearrange. You could redefine Z to be the group freely generated by one element. In which case, the proof would look differently. Um, in type theory, it's kind of you often will start from these inductive structures and then build those universal properties for them. And I've chosen to do it in, in that way because it's a little bit more type theoretic. Okay. So just to finish this off, on one side, we're almost right, except we're off by an associativity. Okay. We've got bang loop compose loop here, and bang loop compose loop compose that here. So except for these parentheses, we've got the right thing. And there's an operation in the uh, proof theory that says that composition is associative, which we can apply to, let's see, bang loop, loop, and loop to the pause n. And I think we're going to need that backwards because of the way that I defined it. OK. And that's good. So we ended up off by composition. Other than that, we were good. And then here, on the one side, we have loop to the pause n. On the other, we have the identity path compose loop to the pause n. So what we need here is that composition has the identity as its unit. OK. Loop to the pause n. So this is saying that, uh, and we're going to flip that one around too. OK. So we have what we wanted. So this is just saying that if I go somewhere and then stay still there, that's the same as just going there somewhere. OK? So I can fill the goal. Um, let's see. The neg one, in fact, simplifies out to being exactly the identity. <laughs> Done. We've proved a theorem. OK? So what I wanted to do is give you a flavor for what it looks like to prove theorems with this thing, which is basically, at the most basic level, you just kind of appeal to these axioms about the structure of paths and kind of chain them together. And there's ways to automate this and get the computer to do a whole lot of this reasoning for you. People have written tactics that just sort of do all this stuff for you. But it's good to write it out by hand at least a few times to sort of see what the moves are and how these things fit together. OK. Mm -hmm. So thus far, I don't think we've said anything that we can fra can't phrase in regular mathical, mathematical reasoning. So why I think. Is well, so basically, so far in this very basic example, the only aid we got was sort of simplifying definitions automatically. So you might have thought through why, when I do this case, it turns out to be that I can just give back the identity. But in fact, there's a little bit of work that you know, the computer did to simplify here. But really, when we talk about computer assisted, it's using these things called tactics, which sort of say, please find a proof according to these lemmas and things like that. And that's not something I'm going to talk about at all today. OK, good. So that's a flavor for how these kinds of proofs go. Questions? Um, good. So now what I want to do is kind of go along at a little more high level and explain to you the rest of this proof that pi 1 of s1 is z. So the first person to do this proof in type theory was <coughs> Mike Shulman. And then after Mike did the proof, I kind of looked at it and came up with sort of a type theory-based simplification of it. And I'm going to show my version, which sort of shows off some features of the type theory. So there's going to be some kind of surprising stuff in the type theory that's going to come up in a little bit. OK. So now let's get to the good part. So the first thing we did, so where are we in this picture? What we've done so far is just to give the map, oops, I erased it, that goes from a number to loop to the n. Now we want to come back. And the way that we come back is by defining the universal cover. So we want to define that helix thing over there in type theory. And the way that we define the helix in type theory 
is by using what's called circle recursion. So the idea with circle recursion is to define a function from s1 into a, where a is some type, it suffices to give a point a colon a and a path alpha from a to a in a. So which is to say, if you want to define a map from s1 into some type a over here, what you have to do is you have to find a point and you have to find some loop in it. That's alpha. Okay? So we're defining the circle by this universal mapping property. We're saying that maps out of the circle into A correspond to points and paths. In particular, we can take A to be the space of types, that is, the space of spaces. And by Voivodsky's univalence axiom, what the univalence axiom says is that in type, that is, in this space of spaces, the paths, so it's a space of types, where paths are equivalences. So here, if I have the type z, the integers, then one of the paths from z to z will be the successor equivalence. So successor, sending n to n plus 1, is an equivalence on the integers. Therefore, that's a path in this space type of types, like z, up to isomorphism, up to equivalence. Which means that I can define a map from the circle into the space of types by giving z and this successor equivalence. So successor here is like, I'm just kind of trying to draw this as a path in this space of types from z to itself. Okay. So this is going to correspond to this universal cover. Okay? And the reason this corresponds to the universal cover is what we're saying is that the cover, what we're doing here, if we define cover, which goes from S1 into type. So we're going to represent the cover as what's called a fibration, which you can think of as a function from the circle into this space of types. And for any point, sorry, for any point x on the circle, cover of x will be a type. And what this is supposed to represent is the fiber over x. Okay? So in particular, what we'd like to say is that. The fiber over the base point is the integers. That is, we have integer many points going up here. And when we go around the loop down here, that going around the loop once lifts to going up on the helix, which is to say, in the fiber over the base point, we're going from 0 to 1 when we go around the loop once. So the lift of going around the loop into this cover is exactly the successor function. Okay? And that's exactly what this line of code here says. So let's look at this line of code cover. So here is the definition of the universal cover in type theory. It's a function from S1 into the space of types up to equivalence. The cover of X is defined by S1 recursion. That is this idea that 
to give a map from the circle into a space, it suffices to find a point z and a loop successor. And the point we give is the integers, because the fiber over each point is the integers. And the path we give, the isomorphism, the equivalence that lifts the loop, is successor. Okay, So what this line of code in the type theories encoding is this idea of the universal cover. The key thing about the universal cover is what I was just saying. So here's a fact about the universal cover. Transport here is the idea of lifting. So let's look at transport. Transport here is this idea of if I have a base space down here, then if I have x and y in the base, here I have the fiber uh, cover of y. Here I have the fiber cover of x. And what transport is saying is that if I have a path down here, let's call it alpha, so alpha is a path from x to y, then what I get is a function here, transport by alpha with the cover, which goes from the fiber over x to the fiber over y. So transport is, in the type theory, the analog of the path lifting property for a fibration, the thing that says that if I have a map in the base, I get a map between fibers. And the key fact about the universal cover, basically the only thing I need to tell you, is that when I lift the loop into the cover, okay, that's going to be a function from cover of base to cover of base. We know that cover of base is z. We know that cover of base is z. And that function that we get by transporting in the cover, the loop, is going to be the successor function. Okay? And then there's a little proof here that does an equational deduction of this fact from the axioms that we already have in the type theory. So I'm not going to go through that. Conversely, if you go backwards, so if you transport in the cover on loop inverse, that gives you the predecessor function. So when I transport on, if I take the path that starts here and goes around this way, then I'm going to go down one here and get the predecessor function. Yes, yeah. So, like, there are ways to do this proof in more generality. I thought that no, no, for, yeah. Yes, the yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The type of suck. Suck is just a function from int to int that does successor. Standard. standard function, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So, we're doing good. We're actually kind of almost there. There's not that much code left. A lot of this is kind of setting up the definitions, and then once you've done that, you're pretty good. OK. So now, this line here, oops, this line here gives a function encode. And the idea with encode is that I'm thinking of the points of the cover as sort of codes for the paths in the space. So the number n is a code for going around the loop n times, OK? And what I'm defining here is the thing that's going to be inverse to loop to the, that function loop to the that we looked at before, which is how I send a path between base and base to an integer, OK? How do I take my path and send it to an integer? Well, what I'm going to do I don't have any ways of taking apart paths from base to base. I don't have any induction principles for them yet, any ways of decomposing them. So I'm, that's essentially what we're doing today. So the way that I get one of those is by using transport at the cover to determine one. So what I do 
is I say, if you give me any alpha here, which is a path from base to base, then what I do is I send alpha up into a path in the cover by this transport notion. Okay? And then that's going to determine a, path, a function from cover of base to cover of x. So here, this type here says, for any x on the circle, if I have a path from base to x, then I get an element of the cover of x. The way that I construct that element is by taking transport at the cover with alpha. So what is that? That's saying, take my winding around here, alpha, and send it to the thing up here that goes up or down by as many times as alpha goes up or down by. Okay? And that's going to be a function from integers to integers because I haven't said which point in the cover in the fiber over the base I start at. So to read off how many times I went around, I send go around and around and around and around to the function that goes up or down by that many times, and then I start it off at 0. Okay? So I take the transport at the cover on alpha, I apply it to 0, and that's saying read off how many times I went around. Okay. So now what we can do is prove one direction of the composition here, which is to say, let me. Yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the encoding that I defined actually works for paths from the base point to an arbitrary x and says that from a path that goes from the base point to an arbitrary x, I get an element of, sorry, that didn't work out. I get an element of the fiber over x. Okay? Okay. So what I'm doing here, I know that I'm sketching and that like you're not going to be able to follow like all of the details of this. If I had like maybe another hour we could do it. But what I want you to do is sort of just get a flavor for it at this point since we're kind of running out of time. So what I'm doing here is proving one direction of the composition. Okay? So I'm going to prove that if I take loop to the n, okay, start from some number n, for any n which is an integer, start from some number n, take loop to the n, right? That's loop compose loop compose loop n times, then send it into the cover, which lets me read off the n. Then I get back where I started. Okay? Let me do one case of that. So let's look at this case for pause of successor of n. So this here is a line by line equational deduction of the fact that this composition holds. So we start off wanting to prove that when I encode loop to the pause success, loop to the n plus 1, read that as n plus 1, what I get is uh, n plus 1, successor of n. Okay? How do I prove that? Well, first I expand the definition and say that encoding is transporting in the cover with this path, loop to the n plus 1. By the definition of loop to the n plus 1, that's loop compose, loop to the n, all started off at 0. Okay? Then we use the fact that I told you uh, a few minutes ago that transporting at the cover with loop is the same as successor. So I've just replaced this with successor. Then what I'm left with, oh, sorry, I skipped a key step, which is here, transport at the cover, loop compose, loop to the n. So we know that this process of lifting a path into the cover is in fact functorial. So if I lift a composition into the cover, transport at cover of loop compose, loop to the pause n, what I get is transport at cover with loop, then transport at cover with loop to the pause n. Okay? So I'm applying functoriality or compositionality of this lifting to get myself into a spot where I can replace this with successor 
and replace this then with, uh, once I contract the definition, it's encode of loop to the n, and by my inductive hypothesis, I get encode loop to the n back to n. Okay? So the key steps in this proof are really simple. It's just apply functoriality, apply the fact that the cover is defined by saying, when I transport in the cover, I get successor, and then apply the inductive hypothesis. So what I get is a little equational deduction of the fact that this composition works out. Okay? Good? Yes. Yes. So this equational deduction is really deducing a path, but I'm going to gloss that distinction for now. Okay. So now we're like three quarters of the way there, right? We've got the function that, given a number, computes loop to the n. We've got its postulated inverse, which is determined by mapping into the cover using univalence. We've shown that one composition is the identity. Okay. And we've got 12 minutes, which is good. So the next part of this is really not very much code, but uses some cool type theoretic ideas. Okay. So I don't entirely understand how this type theoretic proof corresponds to a traditional proof at this point. Okay? So I'm going to show you the type theory, and maybe after, maybe at T, somebody can talk to me, and maybe somebody has an idea about sort of how this corresponds to a regular kind of textbook proof of this fact. Okay? So the way that we're going to do the other direction of the composition is a little bit tricky. Sorry, let me get the code going. Because, come on. Okay. So it's a little bit tricky because, uh, okay. So what we would like to do is prove that if you give me any P, oh, sorry, the, okay. What we would like to do is prove that if you give me any path, okay, then when I take that path, read off a number from it, and then send it back to a number, I get the same result. Okay? The reason that's hard is that we don't have any ways of reasoning about paths directly yet. Okay? We can't sort of take a path apart and do an induction on it. That's exactly what we're trying to prove today. So we need to exploit some things that are in the type theory in order to do this proof. Okay? We're going to essentially implement the fact that every path from base to base is of the form loop to the n using some ingredients that are already in the type theory. Okay? And there's two ingredients that we need in order to do this. And those ingredients are called circle induction, number one, and path induction, number two. Okay? So we're using induction for circles and induction for paths in order to prove this result. So what is circle induction? I'm going to tell you sort of in type theoretic terms because I don't really have a better story for it at this point. The idea with circle induction is that to define a function that for every point on the circle gives you p of x, it suffices to give a term b prime that is in p of base. So for every x, in, which is a point of s1 here, p of x is a type. Okay, And it suffices to give a point in the base. So this is kind of like an induction principle saying that for every, to do something for every point on the circle, it suffices to do something for the base. Because the way that we define things was to say that there's only one point on the circle, base. Okay? But it's not quite that easy. 
because functions are continuous or functorial inherently in the theory. So we can't just sort of choppily do something for every point in the type. We have to do it continuously. And in this case, what we have to do is make sure this works continuously in the loop. Okay. So what we have to say is that the choice of B prime is continuous in going around the loop, where that's in the sense of P, which is the thing we're trying to map into here. Okay? And that's something that's very precise in the type theory, but let me just show you one example. So what we're doing here with this function decode is to give a map that, remember, loop to the was a map from the cover of the base point to paths from the base to the base, right? Loop to the took an integer and gave you an element, a path from the base to the base. I'd now like to show that this process extends to a function that works for any point on the circle, okay? The way that I do that is by this notion of circle induction. When I do circle induction, I first have to give an element of the thing I'm computing for the base point, which is, of course, just this function loop to the that we defined way back when. Okay? Then what I need to do is that this process of choosing a function respects the loop. That is, when I go around the loop, I take my function, I go around the loop in the sense of this type, I get what I put in. Okay. What does it mean to go around the loop in the sense of this type? Well, we're viewing this type as a vibration over the circle. And when I transport into this type, the key fact that I have to prove, there's like some definition chugging, blah, 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 is that if I take, so start with that, if I take loop compose, to show that this whole thing is sort of continuous or functorial in the loop, what I need to do is show that if I take loop compose loop to the pred n, then I get loop to the n. Because when I transport in the cover backwards, I get predecessor, and when I transport in, sorry, it's not on the screen anymore, the path space here, I get post composition, so just like, Believe me that this is the obligation you get. You get that loop compose loop to the pred n is loop to the n. Okay? Why is that true? Well, move loop compose to loop inverse over there, and then we proved it as the first thing we did in this talk, right? That's just showing that loop to the pred n preserves loop to the preserves pred. Okay? So you guys all did this proof earlier in the talk. With that, We've now defined this th operation and shown that it's continuous on the circle. So what we have here is something that for every x on the circle, given a point of the cover of x, get a path from base to x. Okay? The operation of, so this is called decode because it's taking a point in the cover, which is a code for a path, and mapping it to a path. Now, what we need to prove is that if I, so here what I need to prove is that, this is actually the end of the proof. What I need to prove is that for every point on the circle, if you give me a path from base to x, I encode it by sending the path to its winding number. I say, how many times do you loop around? And then I decode it that I get back the same path, okay? This is the thing that's a priori hard to prove because I don't have any induction principles for paths, except I do, okay? So there's this thing in type theory called path induction. And the idea with path induction, like the way that I like to visualize this is sort of like retracting the vacuum cleaner cord, okay? So if I have a path here from n to m to n, and n, the second endpoint over there, is free. Then I can deform this along alpha into a path from 
m to itself by the identity. Okay? So the idea of path induction, and this is the last thing we'll need to finish the talk, is that to prove something p n alpha, it suffices to prove p m at identity for this picture. So if I want to show something about an arbitrary path from m to n where the second endpoint is free, then because this type family p is itself continuous in paths and that endpoint is free, I can retract the vacuum cleaner cord. I can drag n along alpha down to m and just do it for the loop there. Okay. Now, because we used circle induction to generalize the theorem statement so that we're talking about paths from base to x for an arbitrary x, I can do path induction in order to prove this statement. I can contract my alpha, which is an arbitrary path from base to x, down to the reflexivity path. So that's exactly what this code says. So what it says is I'm going to do path induction on alpha. I contract it down to reflexivity. And then what my proof assistant tells me is that all I need to do is check this theorem for the identity path. Okay? And then it turns out that when I check it for the identity path, what do we have to do? We just have to give a path from the identity path to the identity path because decoding, encoding the identity, encoding the identity sends it to zero. Decoding zero gives you back the identity. Okay, we're done. So we fill and we're done. Okay? So this idea of circle induction for showing that the decoder is sort of continuous in the loop combined with this notion of path induction essentially says show that it works sort of inductively, that's in the circle induction, then check the base case of reflexivity, that's in the path induction, and then out of that what we get is that um, I get the other composition is the identity. So we can tie this all together and say that we have what's called an equivalence between paths from base to base and int. So that's showing that the loop space of S1 is int. And then in type theory, we can define the operation that takes the loop space and quotients it to get the fundamental group. And that will preserve this. So we'll get that the fundamental group, sorry, the set of paths is the same as int. And then what we need to do down here is show the rest of the fact that it is a homomorphism. So that's this uh, notion that it preserves composition. Let me just color that so you can read it. And this is exactly like the kind of thing we did at the top of the talk when we proved that loop to the preserves predecessor. So what we do is that we prove that it preserves successor, and then out of that we know that loop to the n plus m is the same as loop to the n compose loop to the m. Okay? And that shows that, um, in fact, what we've given is a group homomorphism between the group of paths on the circle and the additive group on the integers. Okay, so that's the example I wanted to get through. If you want to talk to some of us after, then like Guillaume has proved that pi k of s n is trivial for k less than n, right? That all of those are trivial. Um, Peter, where's Peter? There's Peter. Peter's constructed the hop vibration. That's a pretty cool one to go through. Um, what else? We've shown that this proof for the circle actually works for a bouquet of circles. So you can get the bouquet of circles is the same as the free group on n generators with essentially the same kind of proof. Okay, and I'd be happy to talk to people about sort of how to work with type theory and how these type theoretic proof works after the talk. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>